kings, queens, nerds, and geeks, Powder Milk here, and welcome back to Fallout Equestria. Now, if you're wondering why I'm talking so softly, it's the simple fact because my roommate is asleep right next door, and we both have to get up early in the morning so we can go to work er, at 5 and cook breakfast for a bunch of hungry soldiers. So, since I couldn't sleep because I took a nap midday, I'm here with this recording the next episode. So, you know, I thought, why not? <sighs> Whew. Also, guys, I'm going to go try to start some game videos. If you guys want, who are with me on the series of Fallout Equestria, be feel to join me into my next video, which will appear the next day. It will be To the Moon. And the, the, um... The platformer game, you'll um, you'll find it once it's there. So I hope you guys enjoy it. To me, it's actually an emotional series. I'm trying to restart where I left off because I forgot what I was doing. So anyway, guys, I hope you guys will join me in the gaming videos as much as I do the fan fictions. So anyway, guys, let's get started on Little Pip's adventure. Blood, it washed around my hooves splashed against my legs, carried by the river that was Main Street. I was standing in the middle of the river, and it was full of corpses. How many ponies have you slaughtered? asked Velvet Remedy's voice accusingly. It sure didn't take you long to become a mass murderer, did it, little Pip? V Velvet? I looked for her in the storm and blackness. Instead, my eyes found only the bullet-savaged wall of the sheriff's office. Crude spray paint covered it, shouting blasphemies. Raiders had been here, their sickening hoofwork, sadistic mutilations on display for every pony to see. I watched as the pony torso that dangled from the ceiling inside, its limbs hacked off and coat shaved to the skin, heave against its chains and fall to the floor with a meaty thud. I tried to scream as it began to crawl towards me. With a wet, rending, the splayed body on the wall, its flesh flayed back to show off its ribs and rotting organs, ripped itself free and slouched towards me, splashing in the water. I tried to back away, only to find my hooves mired in the muddy street. The crimson ichor in the water coated my pit buck and sank into my coat around my legs. Calamity? Velvet? Help me! I screamed, but my voice carried no sound. A silent sprite bot watched me, doing nothing as the lower half of a slaver pony joined the things that crept maliciously towards me, a long rope of intestine dragging out behind it. I awoke my heart thudding hard and my body covered in cold sweat, to the sound and shake of the train. I was weak, but warm, and less achy than I had any right to be. I was laying in one of the beds in the train's passenger car, a blanket over me. Beside me, Velvet Remedy was waving her horn tenderly over my recently crippled leg. To my amazement, my leg felt completely mended, if a bit itchy. I tried to shake the specter of my nightmare. This was not the first sleeping terror that my experiences outside had spawned but this had been the most deeply unpleasant. The incorporation of my companions, or lack of them, somehow made this dream far, far worse. Velvet Remedy. The last I had seen her, she was fallen in a pool of her own blood, having saved nearly half a dozen foals. My ears perked at the sounds around me. Looking over my shoulder, I saw the colts and fillies from the sheriff's cell taking up much of the passenger car. They looked weary and beaten. Two of them were fast asleep but one had enough of a cheer to look at me and grin. <laughs> that was awesome! The colt waved itself slowly through the air, then stamped it down with a clop. I gave him a weak smile, my heart finally beginning to calm. Calamity turned from staring out a window to welcome me back into the land of the living. Where... okay? I was hesitant, half fearing that this was just another dream waiting to become a nightmare. Velvet Remedy nodded reassuringly. And the slaves. In the caboose, Velvet said softly. Less softly. This train only has the one passenger car. Okay, of course the story is going to be, um... How should I put it? Um, very, very slow in explaining what the fuck just happened earlier. Like, I just left it a cliffhanger with her, with Little Pit passing out. Now they she wakes up in the freaking train car with nothing that's going on. Ugh. I felt the foals needed the space more dearly. So, it was either the caboose or strapping them onto a flat car. 
Speaking as though I would have suggested something awful was not, I decided, one of her more endearing personality traits. Suddenly, I remembered my original plan, and the locked pens that the pony captives had engaged in. But the locks! I knew Calamity could not have picked them, and I couldn't imagine Velvet Remedy in her own youth having applied that skill. She rolled her eyes at me. Oh, come now. I'm not the locksmith you are, and I certainly do not have the level of telekinetic mastery that you showed. Most impressive, I should add. But I am a unicorn. I can do basic levitation. Between your missiles and the mines, I was able to bypass the need for lockpicks or keys. The train rumbled around us. Glancing out my window, I saw that we had already traversed the desert and were clearly well on our way up the mountain. The pace of the train ponies was slowing. We were getting close to the peak point of the mountain track. My conversation with Velvet had lulled, and now Calamity disrupted it completely. Our shadow is back. I pulled myself into a sitting position, testing my mended leg. A shadow? The colt who spoke up earlier declared, Mr. Calamity thinks something's fallen us. I noticed Calamity was crouched to the window, looking upwards through it. Towards the sky. Another. I kept myself from saying goddess in reference of the winged unicorn slaver I had battled. One of those? Like at the sheriff's? I don't think so. But something's up there, keeping just out of sight. If it's out of sight, how do you know there's anything there? Velvet countered. But at Calamity's look, she relented. Another pace, is perhaps? Calamity grimaced. I really don't think so. He returned his gaze to the window, quieting. At least it stopped raining, Velvet Remedy announced, looking out the window. That storm lasted for days. I turned and looked at the thick gray cloud cover. The water had indeed stopped falling from the sky, and the clouds were a much lighter color, turning the sunlight a drab gray. Velvet, I started. She smiled at me, and my heart soared. Her previous grating remark instantly forgotten. Thank you, little Pip. Your bandages saved my life. I looked at her, knowing that there was no way those poor excuses for medical aid, magically treated or not, could have brought her to health. I started to say as much, but she lifted a hoof to interrupt. No, but you managed just well enough that I regained consciousness, and from there I could take care of myself. She cast a sidelong glance towards Calamity. Not to mention you and that interesting friend of yours. Calamity nickered in her direction. I stared at my leg, surprised. Grinning, Velvet Remedy reminded me. I did always tell you I'd wanted to be a medical pony. I studied for it, and even apprenticed. I looked at the beautiful mare, many years my elder, curiously. If that's what you wanted, why didn't you? Because my cutie mark showed up. One day, I sang a song for an ailing gentle pony, and it appeared. A songbird. A nightingale, to be precise. And, when your cutie mark appears, your place in the stable is decided. There was a sad matter-of-factness in her voice. It was a truth I knew all too well. I even begged the Overmare, but clearly it was going to be my destiny to be an entertainer. My fate was written on my flanks. My voice was the most beautiful in the stable, and I could not deny that I could sing, or that I even enjoyed it a fair bit. The Overmare even showed me my genealogy, proving that I was the many times great granddaughter of Stable Two's first Overmare, who herself was already a legendary singer. I nodded, having heard the heart-wrenching music myself while in Turnpike Tavern. How could I fight the weight of all that? The Overmare. She graciously allowed me to indulge my hobby in the small times when I wouldn't interfere with my new duties of uplifting. Are they referring to Sweetie Bell? If they're referring to Sweetie Bell, holy shit, because... Holy... In the stable's flagging round. But my dreams, I was told, were not for me. Suspecting I knew the answer, I had to ask the question. Velvet, why did you leave the stable? Velvet whinnied demurely. Again, because of my cutie mark. She turned, pulling away one of the medical boxes to show me the little nightingale on her flank. Wings outstretched, beak open in song. Do you not see what it is not, little Pip? I saw what it was, what it had always been. A bird of beautiful song. It is not a bird in a cage, Velvet Remedy said, her voice pleased. And if it is not, then I was not meant to be either. Come horror or ill, I needed to be free. I'm gonna take a walk outside. Hold Maybe on. stretch out my wings. I looked up from the book Freedom. I was reading to pass the time. Turns out, Equestrian Army today was all about battle saddles. The train was slowing to a near stop. 
The engine had already crested the peak, and the train ponies were drawing the rest of the train down over the lip and around the next bend before releasing it and jumping aboard themselves. There wasn't going to be another chance to get some fresh air, or for Calamity to get himself a better look at our shadow. I nodded, bidding him to go. Velvet Remedy was probably on her way back from the caboose. She'd been making regular checks on the adult ponies we had rescued, and I was entertaining taking a quick trot myself once she was here to watch the foals. I waited, time seeming to have slowed to a crawl like the train itself. She was taking her sweet time. Had she possibly gotten lost? No, that was silly. You couldn't get lost on a train, could you? I chuckled as I realized that. If I ever got lost on a train, my pitbox automap spell would guide me. Poor Velvet. However could she find her way on a train without it? I had offered Velvet Remedy her pitbuck, but to my shock, she had refused it. I was stressed how unbelievably useful a tool it was in the equestrian wasteland. She said I could keep it as a gift, and as an apology for having given it to me in the first place. She didn't blame herself for my leaving the stable, but she regretted having played a hoof, and truthfully a whole pony, in my decision. I had tried one last time, and she'd finally told me flatly, I escaped that prison. I will not wear its shackle, no matter how gilded a shackle it may be. At that, she'd left to check the ponies in the caboose. I was brought out of my reverie by the draconic roar of many gunfire, followed by the death screams of the train ponies. A mere second later, I heard the switch pulling team, who were currently acting as guards, open fire in return. The foals began to panic, and I was attempting to calm, or at least corral them, when Velvet Remedy returned through the back door, looking worried. At nearly the same moment, one of the train ponies from the switch team burst in, shouting and waving his paws, a lever-action shotgun floating by his side. Slave or ambush! Protect the children! What? How could they have gotten ahead of us? Before I could ask, a grizzly pony wearing slaver armor, spiked hooves coated in blood of train ponies, broke into the passenger car and reared up, intending to end the life of another. I didn't have time to think. I just drew my assault rifle and fired at him. The train pony ducked, his own gun swinging around and unloading into the slaver. I couldn't tell whose shot fell him first. Flashes of my nightmare came back to me. I hesitated, but mercifully only after the attacker had been taken down. Then, with a stomp, I activated my EFS and watched the flurry of red marks fill my forward compass, milling about the few friendlies that were in front of me. I turned to Remedy, levitating out the kneeler gun and fitting it with a marked clip. I had not been able to determine what the markings on the needle clip stood for, but I suspected that any of them would be at least capable of incapacitating. Take this. Guard the foals with your life. I'm going to hold up ahead. Better to take them down before they got back this far, if I could. Velvet Remedy stared at the needler pistol, as if it were diseased. I... I couldn't. Oh, for Celestia's sake. You have to. You're not going to survive out here if you aren't willing to fight back. I pointed towards the foals and neither will the ones you're protecting. Velvet gulped. I mean, I don't know how. No. It's easy. Float it up and point this end at the bad guy. To shoot, pull this little lever back. That's the trigger. She nodded, then looked at me as if hoping I would ha offer another option. I'm not a killer. I... I don't know if I can. Learn to. It was a harsh, even brutal thing to say. But... That was Equestrian Wasteland. The train slid down the track, picking up speed, but still slow enough for the mo- Yeah, that's basically a lot to say, because that's basically how it used to be in the old days. <clears throat> yeah. I don't know how many of you who are watching this has ever fired a weapon, but a weapon just ch has a weird feeling to it, you know? Like, um, I fired a few rifles here and there. Yeah. And those of you who haven't, if you ever get a chance to do, make sure you hold it right, because that thing's going to have a lot of kick. So, anyway. With the force of unicorn and earth pony slavers to leave aboard, two earth ponies with minigun battle saddles had torn through the pulling team, shredding the poor ponies into red meat. The barrage of return fire had slaughtered them in return. I stood my ground on a boxcar several cars forward of the passenger car that held Velvet Remedy in the foals, assault rifle at the ready. My EFS compass was so full of red head of me that it was impossible to track individual opponents. Part of me wanted to attempt parley, if only to avoid the growing pain in my conscience. But that was out of the question. No. Any pony attacking the train went down. 
It was with this intention firmly planted in me that I opened fire on the first slaver to jump her way onto the boxcar ahead of me. My shot went wild and she jumped back down. Damn it! I heard an explosion above and behind me. Casting my eyes to the sky, I saw Calamity dodging and weaving through the air, a griffin in hot pursuit. The enemy aviator a had a brush gun, a much nastier firearm than any I had seen so far, and occasionally slowed in pursuit of Calamity to fire a shot. Calamity, bless him, was not making himself an easy target, and costing the griffin distance with each failure. As I watched, Calamity suddenly swooped upward, pulling a full loop. And to my dismay, the griffin matched his move, looping slightly inside his own to close the distance with him yet again. I heard clopping coming closer, but as I turned my attention back to the boxcars ahead, I saw nothing. Oh, sorry, I had Confused, a bad joke. I took a step towards the edge, looking down to see if they were racing up along the ground, only to find three slaver ponies racing along the side of my boxcar, passing me. Somewhere, a slaver unicorn was aiding them with spells. A magic glow held their hooves to the side of the moving train. Luna raped you with her horn, I growled, feeling incense at the magical trickery, and swung about the assault rifle, firing to their hindquarters, flanks and necks as they Luna rape you with your her horn? K Cat, where do you come up with these insults? Holy crap. That is not something I expected to come out of anyone's mouth. Like, holy crap. I raced down the next boxcar towards the passenger car. Two ponies screamed as they fell from the train, mortally wounded, one breaking his neck in the fall. But the third made it to the gap between cars before I could bring my weapon to bear on him. The train was moving at a fair clop now. I raced along the roof, jumping to the next car and skidding to a stop. I looked down between the cars and quickly pulled my head back as the slaver spotted me and fired a mouth-held submachine gun into the air where my head had just been. Focusing, I pulled the wide-eyed slaver up out of his hiding space. Then, something hit me from behind, sending a stripe of searing pain up my back. I dropped him, the damnably lucky bastard falling safely into the roof just across the gap. I was surrounded now. The pony I'd missed before had come up behind me while I was focused on this new one, a whip clenched in her mouth that she wielded with hellish accuracy. With a crack of her whip, she knocked my assault rifle out of the air, the weapon sailing over the cliff face the track was skirting. The SMG slaver had taken my moment of surprise to reload and now grinned. In his mind, he had already killed me. Another explosion from above, and two bullets ripped through the slaver, felling him. His body, SMG still clenched in his teeth, slid off the boxcar roof. A moment later, Calamity swooped low over the boxcar and banked sharply, his hooves scraping along the cliff that rose up above us on the other side of the train. The griffin swooped over the train in pursuit. I ducked. The whip pony wasn't quick enough and got clipped by one of the griffin's wings the hit cleanly decapitating the slaver pony. I felt my heart skip a beat as I saw the blades that adorned the forward edge of the griffin's wings. Scooping up the decapitated pony's whip, I kicked the rocking head off the side of the train. I curled the whip up in my saddlebags and brought up my combat shotgun and moved, first to one side of the boxcar, then to the other. The spell the slaves were using changed the situation dramatically, and I was painfully worried about how many he had gotten past before I wised up to it. Further up the train, I heard more gunfire as the remaining train ponies fought for their lives. Down the train, I thought I heard Velvet Remedy scream. I turned towards the sound, my hindquarters to the front of the train when something thumped hard somewhere to the front of the train, and then the train gave a shudder as the wheels crunched through a body that had fallen down onto the tracks. Calamity landed deftly beside me. I stared at him in surprise, and he seemed to blush as he hoofed at his mane. I'm afraid Razorwing can't join us. He refused to get off my tail, even as I swooped between the two cars. Calamity smiled, looking around as if trying to find a missing friend. I swear, he was just behind me a moment ago. I smirked, then pointed a hoof towards the passenger car. Go help Velvet! Calamity nodded and took to the air, not even needing to fly as the now galloping train brought the passenger car right to him. I saw him disappear into the gap in front of it, then gallop to the aid of the train ponies. As I did so, a frightened voice in my head asked me what my life had become. What I was becoming, that there were so many ponies who wanted to take my life and that I was charging towards them. The last survivor of the train ponies and I raced across the rooftops and dived down again into the open door of the passenger car, as twin beams of pink magical energy zorched the sky, fired from a white unicorn raider's battle saddle. The train pony who had been with us seconds ago was now nothing but sparkling pink ash, blowing away in the wind. The passenger car was empty. Sort of. The body of a black-coated slaver hung from the ceiling, filled with needles. The spell on its hooves was keeping it from falling to the floor, even after death. 
gave the Earth Pony with me quite a start. To be honest, I would have shrieked just a little too. I'll tell you, I prefer slavers to shoot bullets, the train pony gasped, covering. You can't wrap a bandage around being turned to dust. I quite thoroughly agreed. Velvet Remedy ran through the back door, coming off the flat car behind. Seeing the train pony, she motioned for him to head behind her. Please, go meet up with Calamity. He's at the caboose. We've got a nasty one on the way, I warned her, and another four coming up behind her. I think these are the last of them, but one of them using the battle saddle with magical energy weapons. Velvet Remedy nodded warily, then looked up and pointed at the corpse above. This one came in on the roof. Like an insect. She was clearly shaken, more at having to take a life than the strangeness of the circumstances, but I suspected she couldn't bring herself to focus on that. Not yet. I began to wonder if her occasional unpleasantness wasn't part of some coping mechanism for dealing with the horrors of the equestrian wasteland. The Earth Pony trotted past her, reloading his weapon and bucking the door closed behind him. A minute later, Calamity galloped. Okay. There's a lot of chaos, I'll be honest here. This is having me hard to follow what the hell's going on. Like, I don't know where and where they are anymore. Where they are, I know they're on a train, that's as far as I know. And they're getting ambushed by slavers, and this is like fucking crazy. And like, it's just so hard to ca like, to keep track of everything. Will this end? Also, I forgot to mention that this chapter is also called Derailed. So, I wonder how that's gonna end. Hold up. Every pony's in the caboose and I kicked it off. Slavers won't be getting to him from there. He lowered his head and stomped to the floor. Here's where we hold the line. There was no time for such discussion. Clamney had barely spoken his intent when three slavers, led by the unicorn pony, came into the car at us. Not from in front or behind, but through the windows. The passenger car exploded into violence. Sats locked onto the slaver coming through the window on my left. At this range, I could hardly miss. Unfortunately, neither could they. Velvet Remedy's horn glowed as I fired into the chest of my first target, once and again. His armor stopped much of the damage, but it knocked him back, his own shot grazing my cheek. I turned to the second, but not quickly enough to stop him from swinging his magically enhanced sledgehammer right into my rib cage. The pain was blinding. I could hear ribs snapping under my armor. My squeal of pain did not stop him from bringing down a second blow across my back. Ditsy Doo's armor dissipated the blow across my body, saving me from a broken back and a very short paralyzed life. Calamity had fired off a double shot from his battle saddle, tearing gaping holes in one of the slaver ponies coming in on his side. Bloody innards splattered across the bed, wall, and window. The last went for Velvet Remedy. Oh, goddesses. Why wasn't she wearing armor? I watched in horror from the floor as the slaver sank his combat knife deep into her shoulder, barely missing her neck. Blood gushed around the blade and turned her charcoal coat a wet black. Her spell imploded, the magic radiating from her horn fading away in an instant. I started to get up, crying again as the bright agony splashed through me with fiery fingers. My targeting spell was still refreshing, but my opponent had already recovered and was bringing his gun to bear. The pony with the sledgehammer swung again, intent on pummeling me into submission. The submission of a corpse. Calamity fired. The armor that had spared the slaver from my combat shotgun was not equal to my companion's powerful rifles. The slaver who had stabbed Velvet grasped the hilt of the knife in her teeth, intent on pulling the blade out of the wounded singer. But Velvet Remedy's horn glowed once again, a telekinetic light enveloping the knife. It was simple, weak telekinesis holding the blade, but it kept the pony from sliding out the blade as easily as she expected, and that briefest pause gave Calamity enough time to turn his barrels on her. He fired again, and Velvet was splattered with the wet bits of other pony. I was in so much pain, my vision blurred heavily. I was having trouble drawing breath, but at least now it was, I thought hopefully, only three on one. But as the slaver raised his sledgehammer over my head, the door burst open. The white unicorn standing just outside the door opened fire with a pink magical energy. With the flash from my horn, the sledgehammer pony found himself pushed away, becoming an impromptu shield. And I blink later, it was a glowing pink dust. Now, it really was three on one. And while I had to fight through my pain to fire, my targeting spell had finally returned, and Sats guided my shots. And Calamity needed no aid at all. Velvet Remedy's horn glowed as she slowly mended my several broken ribs, jumping slightly as the train gave a buck. The pain in my side had reduced to a throbbing, bad enough to wring whimpers from me. Really, little Pip, this is becoming a habit. Her own coat was matted with her blood. The last of our healing potions had been consumed, and both she and I wore the last of our bandages. Only Calamity had made it through virtually unscathed. The slavers lay dead about us, save for the one who had pummeled me with a sledgehammer. 
His body had been vaporized, turned to glowing ash. I recoiled at the thought that I might have breathed some of him in. I turned away, staring at the floor. Though we had won, it didn't feel like a victory. Instead, I felt that I had led half a dozen train ponies to their slaughter. And, in the end, I had failed in the fight as well. If Calamity hadn't been with us. Reading me far too easily, Velvet Remedy tried to soothe me. At least you got that one with the horrible sledgehammer. All I managed to do was be a target. <sighs> You're doing more than your share with your healing skills and mending spell, I pointed out. Adding, although I'm surprised you didn't stay with the freed slaves and foals. Velvet Remedy whinnied. That caboose was too crowded as it was. If I'd tried to force myself in there, too, some point it would have suffocated. She finished tending my wounds, frowning at the increased shaking of the train. Scenery flashed by outside the window. Yep. Claimant returned to us, making his way through the rattling train. Looks like that was the last of them. The train groaned dangerously as it tore around a corner, forcing us to catch ourselves. Velvet looked between us with alarm. Don't either of your ponies think we're going awfully fast. How does this train of yours slow down? We use the brakes? And where are they? In the caboose. Velvet's ears dipped back. She stared levelly at Calamity. The caboose. That would be the big red car at the back, right? The one you just kicked free of us? I felt a surge of panic. Calamity grimaced a little. Yep. Pondering. You know, that would explain why the look at the train pony was giving me. I begin to see how you got your name, Velvet said flatly. Several minutes of confirming our situation and arguing what should be done followed as the train continued to race down the mountain out of control. Soon, the three of us were bracing ourselves against every turn. Ooh, we were still only that. halfway down, sheer cliffs flying by on either side. In the end, I decided there was only one solution. Calamity, fly Velvet Remedy to safety. Velvet's eyes winded. But what about you? Resolutely, I stomped on the ground, trying to ignore the twinge of my recently mended leg and ribs. I'll be fine. I figured another way off. The two of them looked dubious, but they trusted me. So with a nod, Calamity and Velvet made their way to the nearest flat car. I'll be back to you, Calamity promised as he spread his wings. The wind tore Calamity and Velvet off into the air. And then I was alone, on a runaway train. Okay, I thought to myself. Now it was time to actually think of a way off. The train charged forward toward the mountain curve, hitting it far too fast. The train tilted. I could feel the wheels coming off the track. My horn flared with power, cold sweat breaking across my already too abused body as I poured telekinetic power into holding the train on the track. The whole train glowed feebly as it ripped around the corner, canted crazily, riding off on one side of its wheels. With a squealing thud, the train righted itself on the track, already headed towards another turn this one throwing the train's weight against the rising cliff wall. The rocky wall raked at the train, gouging at boxcars and rending most of the roof of the passenger car with a resounding roar. I clenched my eyes against the storm of splinters. When I opened them again, wind was buffeting me fiercely through the gaping wound in the train car. I could see another turn ahead, this one even sharper. Trembling with exhaustion, I knew there was no way to prevent the train from leaving the track this time. I focused again, dreaming I could levitate myself to safety. Groaning with effort, I felt my hooves leave the ground just as the engine car hit the curve and snapped around it. The massive weight of the train could not follow. With a horrific, screaming shudder, the jackknifing train tore from the track, soaring out over the mountain cliff like a snake with a broken head, and plunging towards the valley over a thousand feet below. With all of my remaining focus, I pushed myself up and away, lifting out the open roof. But it was not enough. I was still falling, and fast. My efforts only slowed me enough that I could see the train fall past me, diving down to the dead forest below with an almighty crash. The destruction below me was like the hoof of Luna against the land beneath. Great clouds bellowed up, obscuring the wreckage that I thought I was about to splatter against. Calamity caught me. The three of us, Calamity, Velvet, and I, trod through the narrow valley under the gray clouds above. I had no idea where we were, save that New Appaloosa was many days' travel on my pit buck map. Assuming we could travel in anything close to a straight line. Assuming we were headed there at all. Based on the terminal entries, the slavers of old Appaloosa were selling the bulk of the ponies they captured to some pony named Stern in some place called Philadelphia. I had not lost my rage at what I had read, and the wicked, cruel things these ponies were doing. I 
kept it to a low simmer in the back of my mind. If I had my way, Philadelphia was next. But I could not ignore our more pressing concerns. We were in desperate need of medical supplies. Likewise, the water and food calamity on I had packed was insufficient to support three ponies for several days. We needed safe shelter and resupply. Once again, we had rested for several hours. The three of us had just been through a harrowing battle, and it would have been insane, if not impossible, to press on without giving ourselves time out. In truth, we needed much more than we took. I felt myself so weakened by my extreme feats of telekinesis that I found myself unable to levitate even something as small and relatively light as Little Macintosh. But the unfamiliar and possibly hostile environment did not encourage dallying. The valley was strewn with black, dead trees and bits of debris. Not from the train, his crash that was now miles behind us. These told of the devastation of Equestria's apocalypse. Fallen sky chariots and similar vehicles marred the land. All those ponies gone. <sighs> According to Calamity, we were below the outskirts of what had once, high above us, been the Pegasus City of Cloudsdale. Now, there was nothing up there above the clouds. And on the ground, the only grave marker for the sudden ending of so many pony lives were scattered wrecks of Pegasus vehicles that had been too far from the city to be instantly consumed, but not far enough for those spooling them to be saved. Inappropriately upbeat music, heavy on the tuba, floated like a siren song through the valley. My ears perked, and I began galloping towards the source, my surprised companion scrambling to follow suit. Little Pip, Velvet gasped. What is it? Calamity was no less confused. He knew the sound of a sprite bot, but could fathom no reason why I would be in such a hurry to catch it. Reaching the sprite bot, I enveloped it with my horn's magic, dragging it to attention before me. Watcher! Calamity landed, looking at me strangely. Velvet, considerably further behind, dropped to a trot as she saw no sign I was in immediate danger of being crippled yet again. Watcher! I shouted crossly, giving the annoying sprite bot a firm shake, as if doing so would shut off the music and summon my cryptic acquaintance. Watcher, I know you can hear me. I need you right now. Uh, little Pip, Calamity began slowly. I don't think... He stopped, eyes widening fearfully as the music ended in mid-song pop, and the Sprite Bot spoke directly to me in a voice he had never heard come from a Sprite Bot before. Uh, hello, little Pip. How can I help you? The tinny artificial voice addressing me clearly spooked my wasteland experienced companion quite deeply. I need you to send a message to New Appaloosa. I waved a frantic hoof. There's a caboose headed down the mountain without a train. The train pony inside will make sure it reaches the bottom safely, but there's a lot of ponies inside, including five young ones who can't survive out here on their own. New Appaloosa needs to send wagons to get them. Watcher was silent, hesitant. Watcher, they're not in good shape. They have no food or water. Time is of the essence. Watcher spoke slowly. I don't know, little Pip. I'm not in the habit of... I don't care! I shouted crossly. You care about these ponies, don't you? Do you want to see those foals die? No. I mean, yes, I care. No, I don't want to. Then get help! You don't have time to indulge your shyness, Watcher. Lives are at stake. With a pop, the Sprite Bot's song continued. I released it, unsure whether to feel relieved or disgusted. Little Pip, Velvet nickered, clopping up to me. If you keep ordering your friends around, you'll soon find you don't have any. I frowned, reminded suddenly of my friendless nightmare. Calamity gave me a look that suggested she might be right. Velvet kept walking, and I fell in line behind her. Wow. Man, this, man, these past few, um... These past few episodes have been making me feel weird. Made me feel a lot sad, more sad than anything. I'm not saying I hate the story, but wow. Um, I always thought those fools were dead. All those ponies were dead in the crash, but apparently they're still alive. Excuse me. I'm, I'm, yeah. So I really do hope Watcher does help. 
So, anyway, guys, I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and I hope to see you guys in the next Fallout Equestria. Also, guys, remember to join me in my gaming videos because I'll be happy to see you guys in those too. So, anyway, guys, I'll catch you guys later, and stay nerdy, my friends. Bye-bye.